Hi, and welcome to Teen Kids News. I'm Lila. We've got a lot to cover in this week's show, so let's get started. Here's our top story. For years now, bees have been disappearing from their hives. Just why, we're not exactly sure. But what we do know is that it can become a serious problem. Benjamin tells us more. People, when they think about bees in general, they think insect or it's a bug that stings me. So, you know, why do I care if it goes and stings? But as Zeke Freeman explains, we need to care. Zeke knows a lot about bees. His company, Bee Raw Honey, works with beekeepers all across the country. But, you know, the reality is, is that bees pollinate over a hundred different fruits and vegetables. We're talking about strawberries, broccoli, apples, melons, pumpkins, I mean, really basic fruits and vegetables that we eat every day. That's why what's happening in the bee world is causing concern in the human world. Bees have been disappearing and dying, leaving hives empty. It's called Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD. No one knows why this is happening. There are many theories. It could be a virus or tiny insects called mites that attack the bees. Or the problem may be man-made. We have pesticides that are put on everything, you know, from fruits and vegetables, beans, corn, soy and bees fly around and they, they collect pollen and nectar from these, these plants. And uh, you know, those, those pesticides you know, either kill them or significantly lower the immune system of the bees. So they get sick easier. While research continues, people are working to protect bees. Our goals are to raise awareness about bees, educate, and um, make it possible for many people to get involved in this activity, which has so many interesting aspects to it. Beekeeping isn't limited to farms and rural areas. Many cities like Manhattan are home to thriving hives. And teens like Jackson help tend them. Of course, it takes a whole lot of protective gear. When he was younger, Jackson was terrified of bees. Perhaps that's why his dad suggested they give beekeeping a trap. I thought he was insane because I, it would freak me out, but it started to fascinate me. And once I knew that you're completely protected, it's just, it's amazing to be around that many bees and having them flying around your head and just know that you, you're protected. It's a really cool experience and it's just, it's fascinating. Jackson visits the hives on a regular basis, making sure the bees have the water they need. Before opening the hive, he prepares a smoke pot. It doesn't harm the bees, but it kind of, they don't like it, so they will disperse if they're in a large clump, which makes them much easier to deal with. Jackson carefully takes out the frames. He checks each one to make sure everything's okay. If there's a healthy queen and the bees are keeping busy, there's plenty of evidence. This, the orangey maple looking blobs in the honeycomb, that's pollen that they have brought into the hive. And the almost water colored substance around these bees here is honey that hasn't been capped yet, which they're still working on. And this is all capped honey, which they've finished working on. And that's just storage for them. When Teen Kids News continues, we'll tell you how you can help befriend the bees. We'll be right back. As we've reported, when it comes to pollinating fruits and vegetables, bees are the A team. Without them, we'd have a lot fewer foods to eat. Bees also give us honey, which many say can be a healthier alternative to processed sugar. We have to remember that it's still a sugar, so we don't want to go crazy with it. Since honey is sweeter than sugar, you can use less of it. So what can we do to help save the bees? There are numerous things that consumers and you and me can do about it. Um, one is buy organic produce, because the more organic produce that is produced, 
um, the less fungicides and the less pesticides are out there to harm our bees. Another idea is to plant a bee-friendly garden. Something that has a lot of flowers that bloom from spring until fall. Obviously don't use pesticides in your own garden or fungicides. You can also you know, buy local honey. Buying local honey helps your, your local beekeepers. Or maybe you might want to try your hand at becoming a beekeeper. It's a great hobby. You will be the coolest person on your block. And you'll be helping to save the honeybees. And you'll be learning something that'll be of, of enrich your life forever. The message is pretty clear. If we don't keep a watchful eye on our bees, we could eventually be in big trouble. I'm Benjamin for Teen Kids News. We've got to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more Teen Kids News. As we continue our series on the gems of Germany, Ava goes gothic. <laughs> To be clear, I'm not talking about goth, but gothic, as in gothic architecture. And one of the best examples can be found in the German city called Cologne. Keeping watch on the Rhine, one of Europe's most important rivers, are the twin spires of the Cathedral of St. Peter. Soaring 515 feet into the sky, the Cologne Cathedral is one of the tallest churches in the world. It's also Germany's most popular landmark. More than 20,000 visitors a day come to the cathedral. While a popular place to meet up with friends, most come to sightsee, to light a candle, or just to sit in quiet meditation. It started being built in the Middle Ages, during the height of the Gothic style period. Gothic style is defined by a number of elements. Elaborate decoration, called tracery. Arches that come to a point. A ceiling covered with rib vaults. Flying buttresses. These are exterior supports that hold the walls in place. Plus, lots of stained glass. The cathedral was built to house this golden chest. Actually, to house what's inside this chest. Sacred relics believed to be the remains of the three wise men who brought gifts to the Christ child. Started in 1248, the cathedral took more than 600 years to complete. Work was often stopped. For centuries, the building stood only partially completed. On top of the unfinished South Tower, you can see a huge crane used to lift construction materials, including the huge bells in the spires. This 24-ton monster is called Zankt Petus Glocke. Glocke is German for bell, and Zankt is saint. And I'm sure you already guessed that Petus is Peter. Put it together, and you get Zankt Petus Glocke, St. Peter's Bell the biggest free swinging bell in the world. To give you an idea of how big it is, standing next to the bell is a full grown man. Unlike the other bells in the towers, the Zankt Petus Glocke is only rung on holidays and special occasions. One of those special occasions was on March 3rd, 2022. All across Europe, cathedral bells rang out. in a gesture of solidarity with Ukraine, to mourn those killed during Russia's invasion and pray for peace. During a much earlier war, World War II, Cologne was heavily bombed by the Allies. If you look carefully at this photo, you can see the city was pulverized into piles of rubble. Miraculously, just about the only building left standing was St. Peter's Cathedral. After the fighting finally ended, the city of Cologne and its cathedral were rebuilt. Today, the cathedral is facing another battle, 
with air pollution. It's creating acid rain that's eating away at the church's sandstone walls, turning them black. Work is underway to replace the weakened stones. It's a race against time to prevent a very modern problem from permanently damaging a very historic and sacred landmark. For Teen Kids News, I'm Ava. Most of us dream of the day that we'll get our driver's license. When that day comes, or if you're already driving, the National Road Safety Foundation wants you to keep this message in mind. Listen to this crazy dream I had last night about cannabis. There was this haunted house and three really scary monsters. They enter the house. It's very eerie inside. Suddenly, a cheerleader jumps out. Did you know that smoking weed can slow a driver's reactions? <laughs> that totally scared the monsters, but they kept going. No, no! But what really frightened them was this. Almost half of teens that use cannabis say they drive after using. <laughs> That dream definitely woke me up to the dangers of driving high. Talk about scary! The NRSF produces lots of terrific safety videos each year. To get more info, like, follow, and subscribe to the National Road Safety Foundation. Teen Kids News will be right back. take a close look at your state flag? You should, because you might be surprised at how much you can learn from it. In 1681, the King of England gave land in the New World to an Englishman named William Penn. Since the area was rich in forests, it was named Pennsylvania, which is Latin for Penn's Woods. Pennsylvania is a wonderful agricultural state. Actually, 30% of the state is considered agricultural land. And that's represented on the state seal, and the state seal is featured on the flag. There are corn stalks, there are sheaves of wheat, there are plows, and then above all this is a ship, and that's meant to represent the importance of Philadelphia as a port city. The flag's blue background represents loyalty and justice. It's the same color blue found on the American flag, which originated in Pennsylvania. Well, June 14th is Flag Day in the United States, and that's because in 1777, the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia, and that's when they accepted the first ever American flag. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were also written in Pennsylvania. Despite these contributions to our federal system, Pennsylvanians did not want any government to have unlimited powers over their state. So emblazoned across their state flag for all to see is the motto, Virtue, Liberty, and Independence. And here's another influence Pennsylvania had on colonial America. When William Penn drafted the state's first constitution, he included religious freedom for all. That provision became the model for one of our nation's most precious rights. With Flag Facts, I'm Harry. You won't want to miss what's coming up next on Teen Kids News. Trust me. We'll be right back after this. Nicole's in the kitchen getting some tips from an expert, Chef Johnny Prep. She's learning how to make a mean guacamole. So I'm particularly excited about this because I love guacamole. So what's first? Well, first we got to talk about avocados because basically guacamole is predominantly avocados. Mm -hmm. So you, what you want to make sure is you buy as perfectly ripe as an avocado as you can get or buy them under ripe and let them ripen at your home because, you know, if it's, if it's not ripe, it's too hard, it doesn't make good guacamole. If it's overripe, it's brown and yucky looking and it just doesn't make good guacamole. So mm -hmm. you really want to kind of feel so it's just just soft. You want to, it doesn't want to be real soft, but just soft. It starts mm -hmm. to wrinkly and stuff that's too ripe. If it's too hard, it's underripe, just a little pinch. Mm -hmm. These are in pretty nice shape. 
And then what you got to do, and be careful with your knife, okay? But you okay. want to cut it in half, okay? Remember, you always need your parents' permission before you use a knife. So I like to take my knife and put it between my fingers like this, and then just... So cut. you don't want your fingers anywhere near it, That's right? exactly right. <laughs> and you can actually then rotate it once you get your cut in. You can just rotate it like that. Okay. And so. it cuts it right around the pit. And then you just twist it and open it up. And see how it's nice and green and soft? Oh, that's soft. beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Now, there's different ways of getting that pit out. A lot of chefs will take a knife. If you're going to make guacamole, okay, mm -hmm. where it's going to end up being smashed up anyway, you can just take it, squeeze it, and pop it out. <laughs> okay? That's, a, that's an easy way to do it. Okay. And then you can also just take a spoon and just... Scoop everything out? Scoop right out like that. Now, if the avocados are a little bit firmer, sometimes if you take them, you just roll them like this before you cut them, it actually makes them nice and soft and mushy, too. So I should roll it? Yeah, just roll it gently. That'll see how it softens up? Oh, yeah. It softens right up, doesn't it? It's mm -hmm. almost like mashing it up for you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to let you go ahead and finish off knocking off those avocados. Okay, and mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about how to cut an onion because basic guacamole is going to be just avocado with some lime or lemon juice, some salt, okay, mm -hmm. and a little bit of pepper. That's it. That's traditionally how it's served. But you also can dress it up and make it more flavorful by adding some tomato, it's jalapeno, and some cilantro. Mm -hmm. You can also put some finely diced onion in it. And I'm going to show you a technique for cutting an onion. Now this is a nice refrigerated onion, which is a cool thing because you know onions kind of kind of make you cry, you know. Right. If you I don't like chopping onions, onions because they always make me cry. It, Everybody says that. If you refrigerate them, it makes them less likely to do that. Mm -hmm. So now we take the very edge of a knife, and remember how I said we're going to rotate the onion. Instead of pushing the knife, we're going to just pull it in and out. Mm -hmm. We're going to cut out that part right there. We're going to leave the root end attached at the back and cut it right in half. Now see that I put the, I put the flat side that I cut immediately down because that's the side with the juice that's gonna burn your eyes. Okay. okay. Now this is already kind of peeled, but it looks like it's got a little bit of a harder surface on it, so I'm gonna take that outer layer off, because sometimes that's not nice. All right, so now I have a half of an onion with the root end back here, and I'm just gonna take my knife and I put little slits through it like this. Almost to the back, but not cutting all the way through. Mm -hmm. Okay, just like that. When I get to the other side, I turn it so I'm not cutting down a round slope into my hand. Mm. That would be bad. <laughs> and I'm going to do one cut like that across. And then all you have to do, it goes into a perfect dice. Mmm, wow. Just like that. Look how easy that looks. So you're not, you're not crying, are you? No, I'm not. But there you go. I'm all the way over here. All right, so we got our avocados going here. Why don't you get one more in there and we'll, get, right. we'll get the rest of those made up. You're I'm doing great with that. You, know, you were meant to work in a kitchen, I can tell you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying here. <laughs> you're doing wonderful. There you we go. See that little dark thing right there? Mm -hmm. You want to pull that out. Okay. Okay. Is, is this also part of That's just a little skin. Yeah, you can get that out right there. Okay. And then you just take a fork and you just mash it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, avocados are going to turn brown on you really quick. They oxidize is the word for it. It's kind of a fancy term. Right. How do you prevent that? Well, you add some acid to it. And traditionally in Mexico, they take lime juice and they just squeeze limes in it. Mm -hmm. Some people will tell you if you leave the seed in it, it keeps it from browning and that does work a little bit. And restaurants will actually use a little bit of sour cream. Ooh. And the sour cream not only keeps it from turning color, it actually gives it a little lighter, brighter color. And it adds a little more flavor to it. So that's kind of a restaurant trick. Huh. Okay. Okay, I'm going to season this with just a little bit of sea salt. Mm -hmm. I like sea salt because it's got some minerals in it. It's got a little bit more flavor. Mm -hmm. We're going to put just a little bit. We're going to sprinkle it in there so we don't put too much in. We're going to add some diced jalapeno for that pepper, mm -hmm. so I don't necessarily need to add the fresh ground black pepper. So I'm going to put that finely diced without the seeds, so they're not too hot. I'm going to put a little bit of cilantro in there. I'm going to put a little bit of finely diced tomato in there. All right, here's our last little bit last of Last one, okay, let me get that off the spoon avocado. for you. All right. Let's mash that up. And there's the last little bit left. There we there go. There we go. Okay. All right. We're going to put some finely diced onion in here, okay. So that's how we dress up our avocado? That's how we dress up our guacamole. We've got to put a, kind of put a tuxedo on it. It's got some <laughs> fancy guacamole here. It, it's ready for its black tie event. <laughs> it is. This is like black tie guacamole here. 
it makes it a little bit brighter. You'll see it. It adds a little more complexity to it. Mm, it's got a nice thickness to it. Oh, it does. And you know, avocados are so healthy for you. It's one of the fruit, few fruits that actually have a, a healthy saturated fat in it. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got your tomatoes in here. I mean, this is a nice, healthy dish and uh, it's filling. There you go. Dip some in there and try it. See what mm, you think. Looks so good. Nice and fresh with the tomatoes and the cilantro and the onions in there. Can you taste mm, it all? Mm -hmm. Kind of rocking it up a little bit. Wow, that's really good. There you go. Thanks, Chef Johnny. My pleasure. Guacamole has become very popular in the U.S. In fact, the sale of avocados rockets to 30 million pounds on two days each year. The Mexican holiday, Cinco de Mayo, and Super Bowl Sunday. For Teen Kids News, I'm Nicole. Well, that wraps up our show for this week. But we'll be back with more Teen Kids News next week. See you then.